Good morning. This morning I'm going to play a romance by Robert Schumann, who is known for his literary storytelling and music. Hello? Oh. Not fair to make me cry just before I have to say something. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this gorgeous Sunday morning. 
It's really pretty outside, and um, we're grateful that you are all here, and those of you on Zoom as well. Um, I wanted to go ahead and, and uh, introduce Leanne Mufson, who is our uh, Roswell Roswell Mufson. Leanne, <laughs> she's um, she is our speaker today, and we're grateful that she is here also on this beautiful sunny day. Summit is a liberal religious community bound together by shared principles drawn from world religions, humanist teachings, nature and science, philosophy, and personal practices. We aspire to be a religion of love and inclusion. The mission of Summit is to commit ourselves to building a more compassionate, just, and sustainable world. If you're new to Unitarian Universalism or to Summit and would like to know more about us, we invite you to go to our website summituuf.org. Are there any announcements? Oh, okay. Mary has an announcement. Mary has an announcement. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Uh, my name is Mary Carter Vale. I use she, they pronouns, and I am your director of religious exploration, which many of you know. I have graying reddish hair, and I'm wearing a rainbow dress today with red shoes. And I'm 60 ish. <laughs> I'm working on it, my description of stuff. Uh, so I have, a, I have an announcement. Last night, we had game night here, and we had, I counted, 11 kids and I think 16 adults. So we ate two giant trays of lasagna, and it was really fun. We had a really good time, including a rousing game party box of um, apples to apples game with up to 10 players at one point. <laughs> it was pretty fun. So it was a great community activity. Next Sunday, follow, immediately following the service, we're having another opportunity for community gathering. We're doing a pluralism potluck. What is a pluralism potluck, you might wonder. This is, this, is, this is how we do explore our faith values, is we do things beyond just sitting and talking about it. We're going to do something. So pluralism is our theme for this month. So the pluralism potluck, bring a dish to share this, that's about you. What does it look like? I'm too busy. I went and bought cookies at the market. Yes. I made my great-grandmother's favorite, favorite family recipe to share. Yes. All of them are ways of showing the diversity and pluralism that we all bring to the community. And it's a wonderful way for us to experience that with food and in community. So this is lifespan religious education for all of us. So next Sunday following the service, we're gonna have that over in the salon. And Juan is graciously um, sharing the salon with the whole community, as she always does. Uh, I do need some helpers for cleanup. And if anybody's willing, please let me know. Thank you. We acknowledge that our fellowship resides on unceded Kumeyaay land. The Kumeyaay have lived on this land for 10,000 years, and it is their home today. We recognize the abusive history of colonization in California and are mindful of our duty to responsibly act from our position of privilege. Chalice sliding. And you already know who I am. <laughs> we are all capable by Cindy Feskin. We are all capable in different ways with various strengths and talents. We are all holy, part of the universe and the interdependent web. We light this chalice, cherishing our differences and holding each other in sacredness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please rise for our you you hymn. From all who dwell below the skies, let faith and hope with love arise. Let beauty, truth, and good be 
sung through every land by every tongue. Itarus beho el gran sol, sur la speranza fe May love be the spirit of this fellowship. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. Please remain seating if you can or are willing. Are we doing the hymn next? Hymn number 346. Come sing a song with me. You can sit down if you're feeling like it. Now for the reading. And I will just take a page out of Mary's book and say my name is Aunt Leanne. My pronouns are she or her. And I'm wearing a great deal of purple with a pattern and shiny, shiny skirt. Um, and I won't begin to describe my hair. <laughs> Um, the reading, since I'm a storyteller, won't be read, it'll be told, but it's called A Jug of Wine. There was a small village outside of Minsk, and they made the best wine in the entire country. And in fact, each family had a special method and a special way of making wine, and so they all believed that their wine was the very best. And word of this came to the traveling rabbi. And he told them that he would be glad to come to their village if they would just make a large blending of all of their family's wine, that he could taste that special blend when he came to visit. Well, as you can imagine, that caused a great deal of excitement in the village and they got a nice big jug with a 
tipped up at the bottom and everyone was to bring a special bottle of their very best family wine. But Mort and Shana were sitting down at the table the night before. And Mort said, you know, everybody's going to be bringing wine. There's no real reason for us to bring our special wine to add to that. We could just bring water and save our wine. And Shana said, you know, I was thinking that very same thing. We'll, we'll keep it very secret. We won't let anybody know, but we'll just pour our little bottle and it'll be full of water. And we'll still get to taste the wine when the rabbi comes. Well, the day came and the rabbi came and a special kiddush cup was brought and he turned the tap and poured his wine and looked in in confusion. He said, water is the best wine that your village can offer? It seemed that everyone had brought a bottle of water and not a bottle of their best wine. <laughs> That's the jug of wine. It, it is a story that has traveled to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different countries. But this is how I know it best, from a village just outside of Minsk. Um, the Time for All Ages is next, and I'm going to go grab a traveling microphone and ask anybody who would like to volunteer to help me tell this particular story to just come up over here by the steps, particularly my ahead of time volunteers. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Come on up. Come on up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Please come and join me. Yep, it's for all ages. Okay. I wasn't sure if I was taking too much time for... Yeah, I thought, I thought so. Come on over. Okay. There was a farmer. You, you were going to be my farmer? Come on up. There was a farmer who had a seed for turnip and planted it. How about right there? You want to plant the seed? It's right here. Good job. Planted the seed and watched it grow. Took really good care of it, watered and weeded. In fact, all the other crops, all the other things had already come in, and the farmer was still taking care of this turnip turnip because it kept getting bigger and bigger. It got to be the size of a dinner plate on top. It got to be the size of the doghouse. Better step back a minute. It got to be the size of the farmhouse. And everybody kept asking, is the turnip ready? Is the turnip ready? You're going to say no. You ready? Is the turnip ready? No. No. Until one day, when the turnip was enormous, the farmer said, today's the day. Today's the day. And he pulled at the turnip to take it out of the ground. Give it a good pull. But it didn't come. Farmer's hands went up in the air, no turnip. Hmm, I think I'm going to need some more help. So the farmer called for the farmer's wife. And the farmer's wife came up and linked arms with the farmer. And the farmer pulled on the turnip, and they pulled, and they pulled, but they couldn't get the turnip out of the ground. So the farmer's wife said, hmm, maybe the dog can help. Want to call the dog? Come on, dog. And the dog went over and grabbed onto the farmer's wife. Can you grab onto the farmer's wife? We're all going to pull. You ready? And they pulled. And they pulled. And, you know, it was bigger than the size of the farmhouse. It still didn't come out. So the, the dog turned around and said, is there a cat who can come and help me? Do you want to just say help? Help. help. And the cat came up and grabbed onto the dog. And they pulled, you ready? One, two, three, pull. And they pulled, and it still didn't come out. Well, they called for the children, I'll be the children. And they called for the cow, I'm also the cow. And they called for the goat, I'm also the goat. And then they pulled, and they pulled. 
pulled and they pulled and you'd think it would come out, but it didn't. It didn't come out yet. Well, they were very, very frustrated and they looked around and they looked around and they couldn't see anybody except maybe, maybe, was there a tiny mouse in the back hiding? Nope, must be over here. Let's see, do I have one more volunteer who might be a tiny, tiny mouse? Hmm, all right, well then I am also the tiny mouse who is hiding, hiding behind all, oh, thank you so much. So the tiny mouse, very shy, very tiny, come on up. Very tiny, very shy mouse came up and grabbed on. And before they started to pull, the farmer and the farmer's wife and the dog and the cat and the cow and the goat and, the, and all of the other children and animals, they looked at the little mouse and they thought, huh, this is an awfully small mouse. Do you really think that the mouse is going to make any difference? And even the mouse thought, mm -mm, I can't imagine that I would make any difference but what else were they going to do? And so they pulled, and they pulled, and they pulled, and pop! That huge turnip flew up in the air and into the big stew pot that the farmer's wife had just happened to have ready for it and crashed right into the pot. And so as, as all of my helpers get a round of applause and go back to your seats, um, either up here or over in your chair, either way is fine. They made a wonderful stew. And everybody, is this on? Yeah? Okay. All righty. Um, and everybody got a little bit of that stew. And it was the best turnip stew that anyone anywhere had ever had. And it wouldn't have been possible without every single one of those helpers pulling on the turnip, even the very shy, reluctant, tiny mouse. Thank you. needs a glass of wine that turnip stew <laughs> a good glass of wine uh, if anybody's had turnip stew <laughs> you know you need a glass of wine with that okay all right um, please rise as you're willing and able for hymn number 318 we would be one Our hymn of love to pledge ourselves. 
Please be seated. Um, this is a time for joys and concerns, but um, no one has put forth any. Um, so I'm just going to put forth my concern for the people of Gaza once again, the people of Ukraine, the people of Sudan, the people of Yemen. And any other concerns or joys, please keep in our hearts and open our minds. <coughs> Sorry. If I can do it. We cannot merely pray to end war, for we know that w the world is made so that people must find their own path to peace within themselves and with their neighbors. We cannot merely pray to end starvation, for already given us are the resources with which to feed the entire world if we would only use them wisely. We cannot merely pray to root out prejudice, for we have already been given eyes with which to see the good in all people, if we would only use them rightly. We cannot merely pray to end despair, for we, we have already been given the power to clear away the slums and to give hope, if we would only use our power justly. We cannot merely pray to end disease, for we have already been given great minds with which to search out cures and healing, if only we would use them constructively. Therefore, we pray instead for strength, determination, and willpower to do instead of just pray, to become instead of merely to wish. Amen. Thank you so much for reading that, Jenny. It's adapted from um, the Social Justice Center, Jack Reimer's prayer. So, as you know, my name is Aunt Leanne, and I am so delighted that you at Summit have asked me back again. And since you asked a storyteller, you're getting stories. <laughs> You've already had two today, and uh, there'll be at least one more. And spoiler alert, we're going to look at all of them through the pluralist lens, because that's our theme. Um, I've been a professional storyteller for about 15 years, and I've been a spiritual seeker all my life. And recently, uh, just a few years back, I... I started looking at the traditional stories in the way that I'd been taught to look at sacred texts. And it turns out that when you analyze them that way, they can yield results as profound as those other re more religious, more traditional sacred texts. Folk stories have been polished by a thousand tongues. Um, my one of my mentors, Heather Forrest, taught me that, and I find it to be more and more true as I learn more and more stories, and as I tell and hopefully polish just a little those stories as we go. They change from teller to teller, country to culture that they're being told in, and yet they retain the wisdom from those who have carried the tales. The tale for all ages, the giant turnip is sometimes a giant carrot or a giant radish. But the wonderful thing about that story when there are young people around is that we often tell that to make sure that they know that even the littlest contribute, right? That that's a, a fairly surface meaning on that, and yet important. One of the things, though, that I think is overlooked is that the mouse alone would never have gotten the turnip 
out of the ground. And it isn't just the strength, not really, because they look and look and find the very last one who can contribute. And it's only when that circle is complete that they can get that turnip out of the ground that they can solve the turnip problem. Um, the first story that I told, the jug of wine I, I mentioned, it also goes from country to country, has traveled from culture to culture. We sometimes tell that story because we're a little worried about the greediness of individuals. And so we tell that story because we want to say, hey, don't keep everything to yourself. But when we look at that through the lens of everyone's contribution is important, we can think about what would have happened if there was no punchline, if the wine had been brought by everybody else except Morton Shana, would it still have been the best of that little village outside of Minsk? I don't think so. The fact that nobody brought it makes it obvious. Water is not the same as wine and won't make the turnip stew that much better. <laughs> but looking at it, I think that sometimes we forget that about ourselves. We think our contribution is so small that we couldn't possibly be that important. And yet these stories show us over and over again that all are needed. I'm reminded of a story I'm not going to tell you, but I think that probably most of you know it. The story of Stone Soup. Is everybody pretty familiar with Stone Soup? A trickster comes to town with a supposedly magic stone. And um, the town is suffering from both poverty and an ungenerous scarcity mindset they don't share, especially the one that the trickster knocks on the door first. Nothing was for sharing because they felt like they had so little. But the stranger tricks the townspeople into contributing what they can. Water, onions, carrots, perhaps a chicken. That depends on your audience. I don't usually use a chicken in a UU audience. <gasps> but you can. And salt and pepper and everyone can feast. I've been thinking about this talk. What's the difference between stone soup and the melting pot? The metaphor that a lot of us have come to find inadequate when we're talking about our, our country, our society. A melting pot asks that you give what you have to become just like everybody else. Right? If we melt down the gold or, or any other metals, they become homogenous. They become one thing. And that's useful sometimes. But I think stone soup gets it a little better. The carrot is a great addition because it retains its carrotiness. Salt wouldn't make everything taste better if it wasn't salt, if it was just melted to be what everything else was. The turnip needs the strength of all and not just the mouse or just the farmer. I think there's a trend, maybe, maybe just among the young people who live in my house. <laughs> We're a multi-generational family, but um, I see it more and more. It's a trend against that personal responsibility shaming that, was, that needed some, some revamping. But it's a feeling that nothing I do could make a difference. That my contribution, whether it's not taking a straw because I think about the sea turtles or trying to recycle when I know that not everything is going to get recycled. It's the fact that these big businesses are the ones that need to be called into account and held accountable 
for the practices that are damaging our world, but can't we also do the things that we can do? Are our contributions really so insignificant? The stories, the stories say no. And in this way, I think they're sacred as well. The little things that we do, we can do as acts of faith, both in our own agency and belief that others can do it as well. That we can be the change we want to see in the world, as Gandhi told us. That we can listen to the probably apocryphal quote from Margaret Mead about the only change in the world has happened from small groups of people banding together and trying to make that change. Everyone's contributions are important. All are needed. There's a variation on a Buddhist story that's known throughout uh, the world where Buddhism has its stories. Uh, this particular variation is kind of an obscure one from Bhutan. Bhutan, which I always like to remind us, was the place where uh, the gross national happiness ratio and, and number was more important than the gross national product, that uh, people are more important than profit and have been since the 1970s when King Jigme Singya Wangchak made it a decree. There were four friends living together and trying not to cause each other suffering. There were, they were living together, coexisting, tolerating each other, and they each felt like uh, probably the other three couldn't exist without them, but they didn't really need the other three. The elephant <laughs> Look at me. I'm the biggest, the strongest. I have this amazing trunk and these ears. <laughs> There's a rabbit, a monkey, and a peacock. Come on. What do I need them for? But I know we must all live together and do the best that we can. And the monkey, well, <laughs> she knew that she was the cleverest of all of these four. I'm smart, I'm agile, I can climb. For goodness sake, I have opposable thumbs. What do I need them for? But they surely need me. I, I'll stay and live together with these other three. The rabbit, well, the rabbit knew that he was the fastest. He could get to the river and back faster than any of the other animals. And while well, he felt that they were better than predators, he didn't really think he needed them. The peacock, well, we all know how we feel about peacocks, right? They're crazy. <laughs> they are so vain. They strut around. They know they're the most beautiful. This peacock was the only one that had a little doubt. I know that I am fine uh, and beautiful, but it is possible I need the other three. Well, I just don't know how yet. And one day, the divine being came by with some seeds and plopped one down right in the middle of the four friends and said, the fruit of this will bring you to the balanced place. And disappeared. Well, it threw the four friends into a tizzy. What were they supposed to do? How could they, would, were they supposed to share it? What would they do with this seed and the peacock, the peacock of all of the four of them? The peacock said, I will plant it. And he dug and he took his beak and he planted that seed and he said, and I will shade it during the day with my magnificent tail. But in order for anything to grow, someone will have to water it and someone will have to fertilize this seed and and given the area we're in someone's going to have to protect it from those browsers who come by while it's a sprout and and if it does grow into a tree well 
somebody will have to provide some strength to help it grow. I can get the water, said the rabbit, and dashed off. And, well, I know a lot about fertilizer, said the monkey. It was quite handy with fertilizer. And so the rabbit watered every day, the peacock shaded every day, the monkey fertilized as needed, and the elephant thought, well, I, I can protect this plant, and, and as it grows, I, I will stand here and be a support with my strong legs and my magnificent trunk. And day by day, the seed grew magically exponentially to how you or I have ever seen a, a sprout grow into a sapling, grow into a tree, but it just kept getting taller and taller and taller. The first branches didn't even appear until they were up above where the elephant's trunk could reach. And up above those branches was where the fruit appeared. Well, the four friends stood down on the ground looking up and the monkey said, well, I can't climb up there unless I could reach that branch. And even if elephant lifted me with the trunk, I wouldn't be able to. And rabbit said, oh, I can't jump that high. And peacock said, I can barely fly. I would never be able to reach the fruit. They stood for a while and peacock thought, well, Maybe if elephant, you put monkey on your back and we put rabbit on monkey's back and I climbed on rabbit's back, I would be able to fly just enough to get up to the fruit. And the other three were dumbfounded to think that they might actually need each other, but they gave it a try. And when monkey and rabbit and peacock were all in place, peacock leapt up and landed in the tall branches where the fruit was and said, oh, I'll never be able to carry this down. And monkey said, just throw it. Just throw it to rabbit. And peacock threw and rabbit jumped and was able to grab the fruit and bring it down to monkey. And monkey climbed down elephant's trunk and brought the first fruit to the ground. And they did that over and over again until they had enough for all. And then they sat and shared and looked at each other. We are harmonious friends. We all need each other. So I think the message of the four friends, the four harmonious friends is clear that all, all are needed. And with old stories like this, we all get to contemplate what we see in there. I've shared with you what I see, what I think is clear the way I was taught to look at sacred texts and bring that out. All are needed. Even if you're a big, strong elephant, you might need the rabbit and the monkey. No matter how good a climber you are, you might need a boost. And even if you can't exactly fly, maybe you can fly just enough. Mice and farmers' wives are both necessary. The wine you make and you, just as you are, are not insignificant contributions. If there's a turnip problem, and isn't there always a turnip problem? We need all the perspectives, all the ways of knowing, even if we don't understand them right away. As we share with each other, remember, no contribution is insignificant if we do it with faith in ourselves and others that we can. 
make a difference. And to make a difference, all are needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. That was fun and interesting and heartfelt. And a great segue into our offering. <laughs> Let us quiet our minds and hearts and think about how how we can share in whatever financial gift you might be able to um, put forth today. The smallest gift is welcome. For those of you on Zoom, the link can be found in the chat box. Please select the Sunday plate option to allocate your do donation to the appropriate account. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all for being here today. We're a little sparse, it seems, but grateful for every one of you. Thank you. Uh, please, well, after our closing circle song, we'll have a five-minute break. And then please be seated if you want to participate in our community discussion after the service. Um, so would everybody rise? We can make a circle today, I think. Wait, oh, benediction, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I jumped the gun here. Okay. Okay. That's you. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> that's you. That's okay. me. Jenny, Jenny's done plenty. <laughs> We're undoubtedly getting up for a circle in a moment. I, um, I will go ahead and combine the benediction and the closing words um, and extinguishing the chalice. <laughs> Remember, no matter how small the mouse, without them the turnip stays in the ground. No matter how insignificant our jug of wine seems, without it the whole is diminished. No matter how often we may look at our neighbor and wonder if a peacock really must have a place in our world, all are needed. As we extinguish this flame, go out and be the change. Look for the different, the incomprehensible, and extend understanding to those we don't understand. Go in peace. Be makers of peace. We need all of you. Go be your authentic self. make a big circle. Ready? Well, I...